to Prince George, Peace River in the 2011 election and re-elected in the 2015 election as a member of the Conservative Party of Canada. Mm -hmm. Since coming into office, Bob has sat on several committees, including the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Food, the Standing Committee for Natural Resources, Standing Committee for Veterans Affairs, and the Standing Committee for Procedure and House Affairs. He has also served as Vice Chair of the Standing Committee on Human Resources, Skills, and Social Development, and the Status of Persons with Disabilities, and Critic for the Asia Pacific Gateway. He also serves as the Chair of the BC Yukon Conservative Caucus, Co-Chair of the Parliamentary Outdoor Caucus, and Chair of the Canada-Austria Parliamentary Friendship Group. And we're happy to have him here today. It's taken a while to organize. Welcome. Sure, yeah. Thanks for, for having me. Uh, okay. <coughs> No, I just uh, figured we, we'd update you on what I'm doing in Ottawa and just some of the roles that I have. And you've mentioned most of them. I think my most significant role uh, recently is Chair of the Access to Information Privacy and Ethics Committee. How many know what that actually is? Bonus points if you know. What it, how many know about the Cambridge, uh, Facebook, sorry, Facebook Cambridge Analytica issue? How many have heard of that one? Let's see the hands, just so I know. Okay, good. Uh, we've been really tasked, I'm the chair of that committee in Canada, and I'm, uh, I'm the chair of one of four opposition chaired uh, um, committees in Canada. So most are chaired by the government. We're in opposition this time, so I'm one of those four chairs of that particular committee. So right now we're overseeing how Facebook's handled a bunch of your, your information and how really they've mishandled that uh, privacy. And uh, we're working with the UK committee chair, Damien Collins, and we're looking at, at a meeting on November 27th of having Mark Zuckerberg appear before us to really answer for some of Facebook's uh, practices in their business and uh, the troubling practices that they actually have. A lot of us use Facebook. We were talking about it. I'm a Facebook user. I wish my mom a happy birthday on Facebook just last April, but what they're doing with some of your information is alarming, to say the least. And what, what their platform is being used for is even more alarming. And what we've used the term lately is it's being weaponized around the world. Uh, so it's being used as a weapon in elections. So literally democracies are, are being won and lost on that platform, the way they uh, are allowed to campaign, etc. Uh, on Facebook, that's been used, but also literally as a weapon to start wars and to have people, people are ending up, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, ending up dead as a result of, of the, the platform not necessarily being able to handle what it's being used for now. And what uh, Zuckerberg had said to us, and you know, somewhat innocently so, they started off this one platform to be this communications tool, and it's turned out to be this big, enormous thing that they have to monitor. Uh, it has billions of accounts around the world. Uh, in Canada alone, there's 23 billion Facebook <coughs> accounts attached to individual users. So just think of that, that's about three quarters of our population have a Facebook account. Uh, so it's massive, mass massive amounts of data that they're using, etc. So anyway, what we're tasked with is trying to make sure that your privacy is protected and that it's not going to be weaponized in Canada. And I'll just finish with this as, and kind of a, we can open it up for questions later, but the biggest concern that I have in our democracy in Canada and how it relates to us here, we have Canadian groups that have been uh, manipulating the, their system. Uh, and this is the example I use uh, for any social media, whether it's Google, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, all the rest. Uh, it's one thing to be where you're using that to find a red widget is the term that I've said. So you're trying to find a red widget in Chetwind. Uh, you pull it up on Google, red widgets, and it shows you, oh, it's uh, the home hardware just down the street. They have red widgets there. Great. That helps you find what you want. That's good. But what we don't, this is an example in the bad that I would use, is company, coffee company X has paid Google a whole bunch of money to sell their coffee. So they're competing with the Tim Hortons and McDonald's of the world. Uh, uh, and they pay Google a whole bunch of money to advertise. So Google now, instead of just bringing you right straight to coffee company X, or let's say to Tim Hortons or McDonald's, it brings you by one of their coffee stores first. So it's a slight manipulation. Right? Now, just fast forward a little bit, just imagine that on a massive scale in an election, which we've seen a whole bunch of this happening in just up in the midterms, prior to the midterms in the US, the, even this week, uh, or last week. And this is where uh, the example I've used is we might have certain groups that are anti-resource development. I'm a pro-resource development MP. We might see ads that appear on my Facebook feed 
during an election that say ba Bob Zimmer is a bad guy. Let's just use that as, that, those would be nice words. I could handle those. Uh, the problem is, is that those ads might be ran and paid for by somebody in Russia, China, or somewhere completely around the globe somewhere else. We don't think that's fair because you're not supposed to be allowed to advertise in, in, in federal campaigns if you're an outside of Canada uh, group. So this is where they can really pull the strings and manipulate elections. They've done it already. We've had witnesses that appeared at our committee. They've already done this in Africa, in reality. They've done it in the US and depends, looks like both sides have been involved. But needless to say, it's still a big deal for us. But let me get back to Chetwin and what matters to us here. So some of this stuff we've been really dealing with, even today we had a, a meeting with the new council in Chetwin just about uh, the caribou issue. And uh, what seemingly was a somewhat of a minor issue, other than the fact the herds are decreasing and we're concerned about why that is happening. But what the government's response to that declining numbers in, in the caribou population, uh, what the government response is going to be. And our concern is that they're going to take huge swaths of land in northern BC, in northern Canada, and just say, look, we're going to keep those as national parks just in case. So any kind of forestry activity, any kind of mining activity, any kind of oil and gas activity is going to now be said to, to be uh, maybe not in the best interest of the caribou population and, and possibly stopped. And now we say possibly because we don't quite know what their plan is. Uh, what they've already come out with is a concern about populations and, and an intent to do something to help that population. And again, our concern and we talked about with uh, mayor and council is that they're just going to push whole tracts of land out of the usability uh, realm. And, and part of that, that area is Chetwin. And part of the other areas in northern BC and northern Alberta, etc. So we're trying to find a, a real good way to combat that. And still address the issues with caribou, because we still know the herds. We still like them to, to get bigger, not smaller. But not at the expense of... Uh, well, I think we can do both. I think we can increase caribou populations and we can see mines go forward and uh, logging continue to go forward as it has in BC for hundreds of years. Um, but uh, we need to have, we need to be a little bit creative on how we respond to this, this threat that's growing. Um, I guess I don't need to talk a whole lot more than that. Uh, some of the roles you already mentioned, I'm co-chair of the Parliamentary Outdoor Caucus, which it's, it's a fancy name for I'm the hunting, fishing and angling guy, angling and outfitting guy. So we try and support those, those industries and uh, there's outfitters around here. There's some of you I'm sure go, go uh, hunting and like to fish. And so what I do as, uh, as a co-chair, so I really organize the group. I co-chair it with a liberal and I'm a conservative. So we really try and come at it from both sides. And we like to say it's really a non-partisan issue because we all like to fish and hunt. And, and try and make sure that the policies are good policies going forward so that will continue well into the future. Uh, my co-chair is Goody Hutchings from Newfoundland. So again, we work on a lot of these policies together. Um, I'm BC caucus chair also. So in all the conservative members of parliament, I'm the chair of that group. And uh, we have usually meetings twice a year. We meet every week in Ottawa just to talk about BC issues and Yukon. But we usually have two meetings across the province to try and talk about issues. We were in Kamloops uh, last May. We've been on the island before. Uh, we try and have a good understanding of what's going on in the province, whether it's at the Port of Vancouver, YVR, Prince George Airport, to, to Chatwin, to really across the whole province, we try and represent it equally and make sure that's, that's there. But I'm going to open it up for questions because I have a feeling that you have some questions. Um, and Leo's, well, he's still, he's, he's staying awake, <laughs> interested so far. <laughs> but if you have any questions, just go ahead. And it's nice to meet the new mayor. Uh, Alan this morning too. It's great to meet you and best of luck in your future. Thank you. I've got one, uh, yeah. Bob, before we go on to the serious questions, yeah. uh, what's your background in, uh, in the region here? Before, uh, was born in Dawson. That don't, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I was born in Dawson Creek, so my mom uh, was from the Cameron family that, that homesteaded back there in, I think, 1928. They came in. So it was pre-World War II. Most came in in World War II, but they were here before. They were actually, at mile 28, my grandpa was a blacksmith and used to deal with the wagons and the, the vehicles that would come up the highway. 
because that was usually a stopping point right at the hill there on mile 28, just on the downside of it. Uh, and so, uh, who knows Dawson Creek fairly well? Do you know where Walmart is now? Mm -hmm. There's a farm right across the street to the south. That used to be my grandpa and grandma's farm. So, I've been here all my life. The only time I've been away really has been, I've been in Ottawa for four years. We lived there for just a period of time when the kids were small. And then when I went to school, but I've been here most of my life. And uh, we came back from Ottawa uh, two years ago because we had a house there and I would come back regularly. But people would say, why would you come back? Why would you, you leave a nice city like Ottawa to come back to Fort St. John? Because that's where I live now. And I said, well, Ottawa is really nice and there's nice people there, but it's not home. It just isn't. And it's hard to explain that to certain people, but uh, we're happy that we're back and we're really enjoying it being back. My kids play hockey, two of the younger ones. My daughter, she plays in a competitive league with some Chetwin girls. They play on the Predators. Um, my son plays on the Dawson Creek Canucks uh, Junior B team. And my older two boys are working. So that's kind of the way our family looks. So any other questions? Yeah, go, go ahead first and then up here. Go ahead. Maybe just say your name too so I can get a name to face. Angie. Yeah. I was just wondering, you were saying that it's possible that they, uh, that the government might want to turn uh, areas into national parks. Yeah. But is there, what are other possibilities? Has there been anything else said what they might do? Well, I say national parks. That's, national parks are an official thing, so I don't really mean a, an official national park per se, but it would, the intent of it would be the same, in that it would be areas of, of the province that would be really secluded from development. And development broadly meaning being able to be accessed for forestry and timber, to be used for oil and natural gas, all that. So it would basically be pushed out of that realm or pushed into another realm where other people would be making that decision other, other than governments. And it's just concerning because we're, there's already so many regula regulatory changes that have happened in the last couple of years in BC and really across Canada. Uh, the last thing I want to see is companies like West Fraser and Canfor and other ones continue to progress and migrate south and that's into the states because we're not competitive enough here with our tax regimes, we're over-regulated with uh, some environmental issues and caribou being possibly another over-regulated situation and I'm just concerned about all that adds up to it's too risky for people to invest here and they start going south and with that go our jobs and our livelihoods and all the rest of it. Yeah, up here next. Yeah, and then I'll go Leo. Uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, Roger, Roger yeah. Roy. Um, I'm just wondering, you're on a committee about privacy. Uh, what's your position or your perspective on this uh, CRA data collection oh, yeah. scandal? Uh, yeah, so the question that, uh, so Roy. Roger. Roger, Roger, sorry. Uh, last name's Roy, right? Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so what's been floated by, um, CRA is they're going to basically share or, or Statistics Canada wants to access it was it originally understood as 500,000 individuals banking information okay and using it only for statistical analysis right so they said it wasn't going to involve any personal information and I kind of rolled my eyes well your banking information is completely personal information but now it was discovered last week, just before we rose, it wasn't 500,000 people, it was 500,000 households. So you could times that by three to four quite safely and uh, deeply alarmed by it, believe me. Especially the, the chair of ethics and access to information privacy. Uh, we're pushing back quite hard that they would reconsider that. Uh, and right now they're pushing back saying that they need it for statistical analysis. But to me, it's just getting a little bit too much into our personal information. And it isn't just as broadly, how much money do you have in your accounts? It's transactions. It's where you're buying and selling stuff, uh, where you're spending your money. That to me becomes alarming because I see what Google does with it and I see what Facebook does with it. And now the government's wanting to do that as well. And what are they going to do with that data? We're not sure, but it's deeply concerning to me. Yep. You know, we, you know, we hear stories of banks being hacked uh, yep. and you know, secure sites being hacked and uh, I don't mm -hmm. think no. Well, it's, and I'll be frank with you, I'm not even concerned about the hack, even though that's 
that's a whole other thing. I'm concerned about the blunt, what they are using it for, what they are saying they're using this information for. Because um, one thing that I know about the platforms like the Googles and the Facebooks, they're selling all that information at huge value to them and to their company. So the example I would use, it's a bit of an aside, but Facebook alone, last, was it Google or Facebook made $33.4 billion in the first quarter. Billion. Like they're making big money. And guess what they do? This is Google actually, Google. They're an advertising company. Uh, it's been phrased before they're a search engine company. They're not. They're really an ad company. And they're using your personal information to sell you a whole bunch of stuff. And to sell that list of, not sell the list, provide that list of data that you have, um, call, call you Joe Smith or whatever, <coughs> is to connect you to vendors that want to pay for that information. And they just made $33.4 billion last quarter to do it. <coughs> so, yeah, just concern. Leo. Yeah, one of the concerns that uh, has been brought to the station's attention <coughs> I've hired through immigration routes, and it's sometimes it's very difficult. What's your opinion of uh, hiring refugees and immigrants? Like Shepard needs laborers, yeah. and we need people of all skills, yeah. not laborers. No. What's your impression of that? Because it was, uh, I had one fellow, actually two fellows, and the actual government control was really difficult. To mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I know. I've always been supportive. I mean, my grandparents were immigrants, so uh, the country's a country of immigration. It's just the right way to do it, I guess. And just to make sure that uh, we saw certain issues with the uh, temporary foreign worker uh, program before. Uh, it didn't really affect, I mean, we saw the issue with the coal mine here. Uh, and it was a, a positive in that what they were trying to achieve because the, the workers weren't there. Um, I just would say it needs to be very carefully done so that the, the immigrants and uh, refugees, whatever you have it, are working and, and being called to places where they're needed as opposed to being in the areas, more in suburban areas in the country where they're not needed and that's where they're congregating. So there needs to be a strategy to get them out to where they're needed, I guess, broadly. But uh, absolutely supportive, especially the refugees. And there's one that I met in Fort Nelson, a uh, Syrian refugee actually, trying his best, working. He's working uh, one job cooking in a back kitchen somewhere, and he also does his copper art and sells it to try and make a buck. But one of those great stories, coming to Canada to try and make a difference in a positive way. Not the person that just wants to be a street dweller and, and not really be a productive <coughs> member of society. So. I think there's a lot of those immigrants that want to have a second start to their lives, and I think Canada is a good place to do it. Again, as long as they're in places where they're needed, uh, uh, you know, where there's there's Canadians just frankly aren't uh, signing up for the jobs that are there. Does that <coughs> answer your question? Yeah, I just had um, concerns. Uh, yeah. Um, when we hired a, a foreign worker, the uh, amount of paperwork, the bureaucracy was yeah. very enormous. Mm -hmm. And uh, made it difficult, and it would have been much nicer if we didn't have to focus on that. And it cost money too. Absolutely. Well, when we were talking about, even when we were back in the day, I think it was 2014. I was up here. I literally had a conversation in the morning with some business owners that were lacking people, like the Canadian Tire owner in Fort Saint John, and and others. And just when we were talking about streaming, streamlining the process of temporary foreign workers. Again, so just to ensure that they're going to places they're needed and not, you know, if there's a, I always say a Canadian should always be considered first for that job. They're the taxpayer, they're the people that have been there before. Uh, that's just the way it should be. That's who we represent. Uh, but if there's, if there's no Canadians left applying for those jobs, those jobs still need to be filled and that's where that comes into play and should be done that way. And we should streamline that process where that is the case instead of just bogging all you down with paperwork. And the costs that are associated, like uh, uh, LMIA is what, a thousand bucks still? Uh, it was interesting actually, just the LMIA. Uh, how many know what that is? It's a, it's a labor market opinion. So if you go to apply for a temporary foreign worker, you need to make certain ads and papers, et cetera, that you've asked for this person and it's, it's a position that's been left unfilled. And that's an LMIA. Uh, labor, yeah, it used to cost about 300 bucks. We upped it to a thousand. Because the promise was there would be better service with a thousand bucks. Turned out it wasn't. It was just a thousand bucks and it was the same service level. So when, in about 2015, I actually challenged because I was in that 
the Human Resource Committee that we should bring that amount back down to the original because it's not increasing service. And they said no, they weren't going to decrease that amount. But long answer to your question. Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. In terms of the... Uh, Just introduce uh, yourself. Oh, yeah, sorry. Josh. Josh, um, nice to meet you. Well, I used to work with the Treaty and Tribal Association and now work in the Robert River and West Morley Group Commission. And uh, most of the nations in the territory are opposed to economic development and providing access to resources. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about the caribou populations and the impacts that these, these restrictions on resources can have, are you guys encouraging these resource development companies to actually go to the communities and work on a strategy to help preserve the caribou populations while still getting the resources they need? Or is there just kind of like this, this battle happening between yeah. people that are interested in protecting that wildlife, mm -hmm. that species and their way of life versus industry who wants to extract the resources and sometimes at a cost? Yeah, I think, I think your question is ill-phrased a little bit though. Because I think your, your question is perceived on that they're not doing stuff in terms of pro-caribou recovery already. And I just read through an FPAC about a 12-point plan of what they actually are, they're proposing, um, in terms of you know, certain practices that they can do to increase caribou populations. So I think your question perceives they're not doing anything already, I think is incorrect. I think they're doing a lot already. Now, could they work more with groups? I, I guess I would ask you that, are they not? I would hope they are. Uh, I would hope that would be an understanding that they're working with whoever's local to get a made on the ground situation for whatever's good for you know West Mo or Chatwind or wherever that particular is because I'm sure the expertise is there on both sides. And if there could be, we talked about even just the way you harvest timber instead of the straight line, uh, the typical harvest or the big, the cuts, the system would be a bit more clever with that. But also have it recognized too with, uh, with the um, uh, the stumpage rate too. If it's going to be a more expensive way to develop that timber, then that should also be something that the government can react to and say, well, because you're doing this, you shouldn't pay as much stumpage. So I think there needs to be an overarching plan to figure this thing out. I th I'd say on the other side, I think the concern is that this seems, the plan that seems to be happening in the province and nationally seems to be going on in secret and only indigenous groups and the government know what, what's really going on. And that's a big concern for these groups because they're saying, well, we don't really what, know what the plan is. We're not necessarily against it, but we just don't know. And then the threat of, of uh, you know, terms like gatekeepers and stuff, well, th what does that mean? Does that mean that we're being shut out of this decision? Shut out of the process? And again, that unknown becomes very concerning to these, uh, the groups that have a lot invested in our communities and bring a lot of jobs to our communities too. So. Uh, I would hope those discussions are already going on. Maybe you can answer that. I don't know what's already been done with uh, profit. Yeah, because uh, you said profit, right? Yeah. Profit yeah. River, yeah. And I know the new chief there, uh, just a young uh, new chief, I think about a year ago. Uh, four months. Yeah, yeah, it's been recent. But I think there's a lot of willing groups that really want to fix this. So if that's what really, this is why I wish the government, if I had my perfect world, the government would say, okay, who cares about caribou that's, that our stakeholders in this particular region, let's all sit down at a table and figure this out. Mm -hmm. If that was the case, I don't think there'd be anybody arguing with that. But again, the problem is, is, the, is that certain groups are being kept out of the room and, and they get worried when that happens. Yeah. Is that a fair enough answer? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, uh, Mayor, if that's yes. any other... Way no, to say that? that? That covers it with uh, not being uh, <clears throat> invited to the table when uh, they're discussing matters that concern the communities in the area. Mm -hmm. So we are kind of like in, in uh, being blinded and not knowing. Mm -hmm. So and that, that scares us. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And our hope is that with this being talked about now that these groups are allowed inside the room and, and part of the discussion. Let's hope that is the case. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I can just talk and talk. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's quarter two. Good haircut. What? Good haircut. How's, how's yours doing, Leo? <laughs> ah, it's coming back. <laughs> good. Uh, no, just good to be here again and concerned always about Chowan. It's, uh, I call it the gateway to the pine, really. It's my, I drive through it all the way, all the time on my way through to Mackenzie and Prince George. And, um, uh, concerned about what goes on here. We've seen booms and busts in Chatwin before. Uh, 
and there's a bit of unknown with the gas plant to Pine River too, and new ownership, or slightly a shifting of the ownership. But, uh, so anyway, we, we're here and we, we kind of uh, see what's going on, but we just hope that we can keep the province. The province has always been a resource-based province about developing our resources. It's, it's shifting into more of a service sector province, especially in the Lower Mainland. But uh, my hope is that governments wouldn't forget about the resource past that some of us still still puts uh, food on our tables and moves over our heads. So anyway, thanks for. Do you have yeah, a, yeah, I have one thing. What yeah. about our uh, our government uh, being uh, in population uh, down south uh, versus uh, what sixty thousand approximately in in our area? Our area is that impacting on uh, not being invited to the table? Uh, I don't know. That would be more of a provincial answer that I couldn't necessarily give you. I would hope though that all regions are being looked at by the government as they should be. Because even if a population is small in certain areas, it, it's still unique as a region. So I would hope that's not the case. But uh, we had already talked about some ways to just make sure Victoria knows what you think. Uh, that here's your input down there and we've talked about it just before we came in for those who weren't at the meeting we're at uh, a council meeting with us so there's some strategies just to make sure that they do not forget who Chetwin is and where you are so yeah just like a little bit of positive about our caribou I believe that Quincy Zahart is like one of the very very few populations in Canada that's actually recovering nice so the local herd that is partially managed by West Mobile for nice. and their partners is actually, I think, the only one south of the Yukon and WT borders that is actually. See, that's we need to be asking you how you how you're doing. Yeah, great. so the penning is you are doing the penning. They are, yeah. So Westville yeah. really for the Quinces I heard is actually seeing like a pretty dramatic increase in their numbers, even cool. with the level of industry that we have here. So I mean, yeah. it's possible and it is happening. Right on, because I saw the penning down in the southern part of BC. There's they've stopped. I don't know if the herds are so small that they're not doing it anymore or what. Yeah, I don't know if sure. like, their penning program just wasn't as effective or what was yeah. happening. I know our penning program has monitors out there um, during like peak, sure. peak predator season. Well, and I was happy to hear too that the predators were getting addressed here because I hadn't heard that yes. uh, for the last four years actually. So that was news to me and that's good to hear because what's, <laughs> it's, we've seen it in different regions around the country though. Certain groups don't like the predator or dealing with predators and uh, a call is a bad word. but. It's pretty, you know, you talk about a caribou too. If anybody knows what a caribou looks like, it's pretty much the run to the litter when you compare it to a deer, elk, and moose. So they're very much at risk uh, to predators, more so, much more so than the bigger animals. Yeah, so they have hunters out during like, during like peak birthing season. Things. Yes. And that also provides jobs in our community as well. So we're employing local members to go out and... Do you, what's your number of your herd over there? Do you have I believe one? it's up to 70. Okay. I'm also not less like... Like Josh, so I'm not still, developing, so this is still has a ways one, to go before it's six. What's that? One eighty six was a number. Oh wow! And in previous years, it was up to three, uh, uh, three twenty, three forty. Uh, I just came back from the Caribou Conference uh, a little bit about you what you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you should be standing up here uh, with me. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I have a little the report there, that I've uh, going to present to council. Yeah. I went all the way to Ottawa to find out that uh, in our backyard they are doing. Uh, conservation at a level where uh, across the country we're asking uh, Chief uh, Wilson on what he was doing and yeah. uh, Soto uh, members. So with that, uh, her bringing up this about uh, conservation and uh, in the, in the uh, produ uh, lake uh, production area of uh, reforestation yeah. and and harvesting and gas and oil and it's being done up here in the in the north right here in the, in yeah. West Moberly. So they're they're not sitting by idle. Good. That's that's what's happening. And people across the country were going to uh, uh, Chief Wilson and ask him, "What are you doing?" See, to me, there's a good example yes. of it all works together, yeah. and it's still the numbers are going up. So we need to replicate that, especially in our region. Then. Correct. You know, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Leo looks like you're thinking. So if you have a question coming. <laughs> anyway, okay, thanks everybody for the time.